What kind of effect do you think the cocoon could have on people, and what state could it take them from, and how it would affect people's lives? That's a good one. Um, so at this point, a lot of it is, is a lot of hypothesis. So we've been working around using about 33 different fields of science to make this happen, and it's hypothesizing about what should have happened if we combine these things. The reality is that no one has yet combined these things and tested them on a scientific level. So the completely honest answer is, I don't know for certain. <laughs> Uh, what we hope would happen, and what our hypothesis is, that chronic stress is one of, is, I think, it is an epidemic. It's something that's making us really sick and making us, like I said, worse people, worse mothers, fathers, sisters, husbands, daughters, things like this. And it, for me, it really is about when you can't go and perform to the level that you want to perform. It's not about performance and somebody else's definition. It's about what kind of person do you want to be? How do you become that person? How do you self-actualize to what the level that you want to perform at, the level that you want to be at? And by performance, I mean everything from, from work, from your interpersonal relationships, to your love life, to how you deal with your children. And we're hoping that by introducing a product that can make you less stressed, not just less stressed, because stress can be really useful when you need it, but that's the thing with stress. Like, it helps you when you need it, and when you don't need it, it's really, really bad for you. So we hope that by helping re-regulate our stress systems, we can help people, be, help them become better versions of themselves, to just help facilitate the direction that they want to go. Um, how do you think this is accessible for people? What's the concept? Do you plan that people go to Brazil and they do it for a course time? How is... So the question was, what's the plan? What is the concept? And how would people do this? The answer to that is, um, again, I haven't figured that out yet. Currently, the design, if you decide to make it a product, is designed for corporate. We have spoken about doing it in a studio. We're also, um, accessibility is one of the values that's incredibly important to the way that we design. So we're looking at ways to make it accessible and open source, so that it's something to make a smaller version that you can then download and bring home to yourself. Um, we're also really speaking about designing for unified world, so it's not just us here in Europe or in the US or in Asia, but other places, and that's something um, we've divided the work into a couple phases. So phase one is this individual product for individual use, and phase two will be taking these concepts into a much larger perspective, so maybe designing for cities. And I'll let you know if we get the grant to do that, and if we do, you'll see it in Stockholm this next year. Okay. <laughs> So the question was, how long does it take to get down from that stress level? And that is a, a really good question. Again, that's one of those another <laughs> complete, we have no idea. Uh, we started right now by doing a seven minute sequence because our sound designer, and that was a magic number, and we tried it out, it feels really great. So this is what we're working on, this total feeling. Um, one of the things we have discovered is that it works well with chronic stress. But when you're dealing with acute stress, so not stress, but something that's like anxiety or panic or terror, it, it's coming from a different place. So we, we think that might need some different adjustment. But, but then again, we only have, you know, two of the senses ready. And, and the theory is that when you can get, when you can impact multiple senses, that your brain will just respond differently. And then maybe we can create a physiological trigger that you can kind of just unlock it. I don't know where to start. Sorry. Yeah. The question was, do you think this will be an alternative method to ECT? I don't know what ECT is. So ECT is when you, you said you shock the brain with electric, or for depression. Uh, that sounds incredibly painful. <laughs> Okay, so I you said that the person will be under anesthesia with ECT. I don't know enough about that, unfortunately, to give you a true answer, but my initial instinct is that this is not something that will be harmful. In fact, we were talking about one of the tests being whether or not an animal would want to go into it. So if, it, like, if it's something that you know a cat or a dog might want to go into, they live with us, they have really similar responses, then, then it would be good for us. And, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. 
So the question was, what about cultural differences and with the color yellow meaning different things in different places and one small meaning down somewhere and you know, I think it's also making that up. And, and that's also a really excellent question and one of the more complex, so it, it is one of the more complex questions. Um, a quick answer would be from an evolutionary biology perspective, it seems that we would have certain senses and certain responses that are almost universal. Um, like fear, like there, there are certain things that induce very specific reactions. How people then react to that might be really different, but they induce internally similar reactions. So there's a reason that, that sound can be used as torture. So listening to too much music for too long of a tone too loud is going to stress every system. Um, there are certain smells that have been proven to be relaxing, like relaxing across the border. Uh, there are and that kind of goes the same for all senses. So there, there's a really interesting research about what specific sounds, what tonalities, what smells, what tastes can actually, how they impact your brain state and your physiology. Now, I say that with the caveat that that is the, the majority. Uh, the way that our perception works is on a, on a very specific neurofeedback group. So you can be trained by your environment. So this might be how you're born, but then if you're born into an environment where something that should be relaxing was always present when, let's say, this is your warm example, but let's say you were being beaten and that it's not something that you liked, like it was something that you wanted, then that smell of lavender, which should otherwise be relaxing, will, it will actually induce in you a state of stress. And so we can't design for every single one of those, but what we're planning on doing is, in the course of the next year and years to come, go explore different communities and see how, how they function. So especially according to stress, stress it is different in every society. People get stressed for different reasons, but this is something that we're looking to explore. And if anybody in here is a researcher, we would love a lot more research on this. So that would be great. Any other questions? I want to be true about the eight senses that you showed. It used to be five uh, not a long time ago, so we have the eight senses and, and the connection to, to magic, how you perceive things that are being magic. Yeah. I think a lot of magic has, 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 has been perceived as magic has become reality. And the lady is only lack of knowledge about the world, understanding of the world, what you perceive as magic. Could you maybe do philosophical for Friday morning? But could you elaborate a bit around the connection between the eight senses? Could be ten tomorrow, I don't know. And uh, what we perceive as magic. Uh, and what the connection between the senses and what we perceive as the magic of the world. So just to repeat, is, uh, the question was to elaborate a little bit more on the eight senses and what we perceive to be magic, and today there's eight and tomorrow there could be ten. Uh, I should add that the eight is something I, I pretty much made up. <laughs> I don't know, I feel like a lot of this I'm almost maybe making up as I go with a bunch of science and a bunch of observation. But uh, I, we've defined senses as things that influence our physiology, our brain chemistry, and our perception. I looked online earlier, there was somebody that had written that there are uh, nine senses, and the way that they describe those are just the way that our sensory systems understand it. And by that specifically, which you wanted elaboration, is that if you think about the sense of sound, sound is interesting, it can do a lot of things. You can hear through it, but it can also tell us where in a room that we are. So there's this aspect of echolocation. Movement can do the same thing. So we have a lot of different sensory systems that work in combination together. Another example of that would be if you taste or smell something, it could smell might spicy or cooling, and that's actually how I got to this work was through research and smell. And that is translating to our body through the trigeminal nerve, which is actually like one of our feeling nerves. Um, so between senses and magic and whether what we perceive today could change and become a lot of things that used to be magic today are reality. Uh, I would say first, absolutely. If you want to know some of my very crazy ideas on this, um, I can share them maybe later or now if you guys want. But I think absolutely, the, the reality is perception changes. Perception is something that we have in every instant that is different. It is different and it depends on our senses. It also has a lot to do with how we view ourselves. So the way that we perceive, our, perceive ourselves and our place in the society and our interactions and connection to it defines entirely the, the way that we view the world. And 
we've seen events in, in recent history, or even in not so recent history, that, that change the way this is. So the discovery of the world not being flat is one of them. Um, for China, for example, they, China in Chinese is the center kingdom. When the world suddenly was different, they were no longer the center. And I think today we're, we're seeing a struggle between how we identify ourselves as, as being complete others. Like we, we, our identity is given to us through the self is someone who we are as defined as not the other. We don't have an actual identity that's full of content of, of positives, it's, this is who we are. And the day that we see that change happen, which I hope is a day that will be really soon, we're going to see a shift in perception. What is it when we start identifying people by different traits? And if we, going back to the experiment, if we don't see, if we don't hear, if we don't have these senses, what, who are we actually? If we're not defining ourselves by our physical looks, what is important to us? You know, if it's not physical beauty, or physical strength, or intelligence, then, then who are we actually? And the, what we claim and what we're actually designing for is the core essence of who we are is our how we relate to others. It's our actions and our level of kindness and our empathy. And that's really the only thing that makes us and defines us as beings. I think that's it. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much for coming to see you next time.